All right. Well, thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank our farmers uh, traveling from near and far uh, to, to be with us today. Uh, I know many of us are very interested in, in hearing some of your uh, uh, reflections on especially the survey results that Jay just presented and then uh, information about your farms and, and um, how you can give us some information on um, how we can better shape some of our research um, moving forward with this project. So first of all, I'd, I'd like to have you each uh, introduce yourself and, and tell us a little bit about your farm. Um, we'd like to know um, what you're producing, uh, where in, in each of your states uh, you reside, and any other information you'd like to share about the technologies that you use on your farm. So Tim, we'll, we'll start with you. Is this working? I'm checking it here. I don't think that's... No? There. Oh, gosh, how about that? There we go. My name is Tim Rucker. I farm in northeast Iowa, Fayette County. There's a little back feed. Yeah. Uh, maybe just back out. <laughs> Check one, two. Check. <laughs> farm in northeast Iowa. Corn and soybean producer. Also in the concert. I'm a, I'm a contractor. I do conservation practices on the ground, put in waterways, uh, wetlands, that kind of thing. I also I'm experimenting with cover crops for the first time last year. I'm Richard Sloan. I go by Dick. So if you see me, it says Richard. That's how I sign my name, but I go by Dick Sloan. Um, I farm 720 acres of cropland in Buchanan County, Iowa. It's uh, halfway between Waterloo and Cedar Rapids, if you know anything. It's in a Cedar River basin. Uh, uh, I was always uh, was my 35th crop this year. Um, I came into farming with a, I grew up farming with my dad, but then went to college, was interested in biology, and, and then decided, no, I really do want to go back and farm. So I swung into agriculture and raising livestock. I raised pigs uh, for quite a few years. Less than 10 years ago, I had the opportunity to rent my buildings out. <clears throat> to a younger farmer, and so appreciated that opportunity <laughs> to come along. It gave me a, a little more time for other things. One of the other things that came up was in about 2006 that the Iowa Corn Growers was interested in establishing some uh, farmer-led watershed projects. And so what we tried to do there was uh, identified some watersheds where we were had impaired uh, by our, on Lime Creek where I was involved, we had lost our mussels in the creek. Uh, so as an early indicator of quality of the, uh, going downhill there, why we thought, let's step forward and try and, and do something about it. So we identified phosphorus and, and nitrogen as pollutants, uh, as well as just silt in the river uh, or the stream. So then we had a project set up where we uh, worked with extension, and then we got a, a word grant, Watershed Improvement Review Board, uh, to continue that project and did that for about three years and uh, we've still stayed together even though we haven't found a new project to be involved with why so it's my interest in water quality that brought me into this project so thank you okay, thank you uh, hi I'm Jeff Gokenar I uh, farm by Smithville which is five miles north of here um, I've been farming about 19 years. The first eight years was with my father-in-law. Uh, I did not grow up on a farm, uh, married into it um, for 11 years. So we've been, me and my wife have been renting and, and making the decisions. Farm about 850 acres, corn, soybeans, and wheat. And we also raise uh, wean to finish hogs. Uh, some of our conservation practices include strip cropping uh, we no-till all of our wheat, half our beans, uh, everything else is uh, conservation tillage. Um, we recently added a vertical tillage tool to try that uh, just this last spring. It's not a very good year to test it though. <laughs> um, uh, we use grass waterways and buffer strips along all our creeks and streams. We do soil testing and pre-side dress nitrate test. Um, and this is my neighbor, Brian. <laughs> yes, my neighbor. Um, my name is Brian Renneker. My wife and I 
Uh, we have a, a dairy farm and we grain farm some too. We're just outside of Smithville on the north side. Jeff's kind of on the south side. Um, graduated from Ohio State in 1985. Started uh, dating the farmer's daughter in 1981 and <laughs> married her in 85. And took you a while. Took me a while, yeah. <laughs> We're in partnership with them until uh, 2006. And that's when we took over all the decision making. And uh, we have 750 acres owned and rented. We milk about 120 cows. Um, we raise 100 acres of hay, 170 acres of wheat, 200 acres, 200 acres of beans, and 280 acres of corn. We practice a little bit of everything. We kind of got a Heinz 57 tillage practice. We, we do conventional con conservation, vertical tillage, strip tillage, no tillage. We farm all over the place, and our land is everything from flat to very steep. So we kind of practice prescription, prescription tillage, whatever the land will allow. We, uh, we inject our liquid manure from the dairy cows. We've been doing that for a long time, and we soil test, and we've seen uh, a big benefit from, from injecting manure to uh, saving money on fertilizer. And started working on the Sugar Creek project the same time Jeff did, so we have a lot of waterways and buffer strips and so forth that we've installed over the years too. Okay, great, thank you. Well. I'm going to jump right into um, a question that reflects a little bit on uh, the information that, that Jay just presented. And um, what he found from that survey uh, was that farmers that believe climate change is occurring and due to human causes seem to be more concerned about climate and weather impacts um, than those who believe it's happening but see that it's due to, to natural causes. So would any of you like to comment on that, give us a little bit more information, either your observations or um, those of farmers in your area, how they're thinking about climate change? I will, I'll state first that I'm one of the non-believers that was talked about earlier. So I'm one of the farmers who probably don't believe that it's caused by uh, human changes. I, I actually had a great conversation at lunch and so I'm maybe gonna be a convert. But <laughs> the, um, I think maybe to one of the, the bigger questions, if farmers thought, or if you thought that farmers had the ability to change climate, and we thought we had the ability to change climate, or change the weather in some way, we would be all on, on board. Because we, be, we would be right there doing whatever we could to change weather patterns. But knowing year in and year out, we try to plan for everything that could happen in a year, whether it's drought, whether it's too much moisture, whether it's hot, cold. So our challenge is to be able to take them all on, maybe not all at the same year, but take them all on and do as good a job as you can within your operation to manage for those changes. So that's why I think a lot of the farmers are maybe disbelievers because we just, we don't know a weatherman that can tell the truth that we can trust. Or, and I, so I'm talking about weather and climate, but we think of it as the same thing. So I, I just wanted to bring that out as we were thinking about climate change that I think you will have, we were talked about how do we bring farmers on board? We'll get them to believe that what they are doing can actually make a difference. Convince us that it can make a difference. Well, I'd have to say that uh, while farmers aren't the cause of global warming or global change, climate change that uh, you know that that we've so changed our environment as humans in the world that I, I and and we're continuing to we're continuing to pull carbon out of the soil and put it up in the air in the form of oils and different sorts of things so um, I'm one of the other side where I feel like well yeah it is a human caused problem in a large part at least uh, there's variations, and I know we have cyclical variations, and a human lifetime is so short to think about climate changes and stuff like that. But, uh, but when we've seen patterns change, uh, you know, you, you just feel like, okay, now my concern is keeping my soil productive over all that. And so whether I'm dealing with it from an aspect of it being a human caused or, or 
environmentally, naturally caused or whatever. It's still my issue is to try to make sure that I farm in a manner which preserves my soil potential to produce good yields. Otherwise, I'm taking food from the mouths of children in the next generation. And, and so I just feel like it's a, my responsibility to do the best job I can of soil conservation and water conservation. So that's, that's pretty much that rather than bring up, you know, if I meet with other farmers, it's, it's, I, I come from the soil conservation angle, from the from water quality angle, from the angle of, well, you don't want to lose your nitrogen by putting it on in the fall. You want to keep it on and put it on there closer to when that crop's really going to want to use it. Uh, those sorts of angles. I, I just recognizing that a lot of farmers aren't interested in the concept that they've, they've accepted that it's it's not a human problem. You know, they believe that it's not a human caused issue, that uh, they, you still might find an opening there where they go, well, yeah, 2008 was really wet, and, and two, you know, the winter of 2007, eight was a lot of snow. We had more snow than when I was a kid. <laughs> and then it didn't melt until April, and then you're late planting everything. And, it's just, and then it just kept raining. <laughs> so we had a higher flood. We, I have a camper by the Cedar River that we go to to enjoy with our friends. And so we pulled the camper out of there and thought, oh, well, if we just pull it up to on this hill, you know, some of our stuff, why well, that'll be plenty high because it's never gone higher than 20 feet. And of course, it went to 27 <laughs> that year. So it was, a, it was rather dramatically higher than anything we'd ever experienced before. Uh, and then this year, it's dramatically lower than it's been for a long time. It's running at about 20% of normal flow down through the Cedar River Basin. So uh, if these are caused, are results of climate change or they're just natural variation, I can't tell you. But still, I feel like I have a re responsibility to look after my farm's productivity in light of what I have experienced there. So. That's a hard act to follow. He, <laughs> he spoke so eloquently and well. Uh, a lot of the things that uh, Dick said I agree with. Um, I do believe that there is uh, uh, climate change due to the increased carbon. Um, I don't know that I feel personally responsible for all of it, and I think it's folly. <laughs> I think it's folly to think that the farmers should be the ones responsible for fixing the problem. Um, there's uh, uh, just driving over here, you know, in a short section of highway, you could see uh, half a dozen semi trucks and a couple dozen cars. And you know that that's going on all around the world. And if you run a car in a garage for just a short period of time, you know things don't end up too well. Um, so I guess my point is. Uh, it, it takes all of us to make a change, and we can plant cover crops and, and do a lot of other things that might help, but if we don't come up with a new energy source, I think we're just going to be going down this road until we burned it all up. I agree that there's uh, been some pretty radical changes. I like to talk to older farmers. The fellow I started working for when I was 13, 14 years old you know he talked about cold winters and dry summers and since then I've talked to a lot of guys and they said yeah they had a summer of so-and-so that was like this and in my short period of time farming I remember 88 and 91 and now 2012 being dry and I remember last year was so wet we couldn't figure out how to get anything done and so you see opposite ends of the stick compared to the original plan when God created the earth and it was everything was perfect we are far from that now and I realized that the, the big variable is us. You know, they threw us in here and, and look at what we've done. And we've got some things to fix. Um, but we're not responsible. As farmers, we're not responsible for 100% of it. But we're doing what we can to fix, to fix what we can. And like these guys said, we're interested in preserving it for the future generations. Our kids, our kids' kids. It might be in-laws. Who knows who it will be. But uh, the land has to remain to provide food because people have to eat. And there's a lot of people that spend a lot of money on other things in this country that don't spend much on food. And if you look around the world, 
um, other countries spend most of their money mm -hmm. on food or water, and we take a lot of things for granted here. So we do need to be about the business of fixing what we can. Okay, thank you. Uh, a few of you touched already on um, my next question or, or something I'd like you to expand more on, but um, I w I'd like you to talk a little bit about the weather changes you've observed in the past um, you know, five to ten years in, in your areas and um, tell us about what you've noticed and then how you've uh, adapted in your operation if you've made some changes to uh, work with those changes um, and what, what were some of the things that you've done. I think we've we've seen changes, and I don't know if there are any more dramatic now than the, in the last. I've been farming for almost 30 years, and I, I we see this every year, and I've kind of talked about that. But maybe the more important question is what are, what are we doing to adapt to the variables that we see year in year out? And I would say our number one thing we have is is technology, the use of technology, and how we are able to um, plant hybrids that are able to uh, resist pests. Um, better weed control. We're going to be using hybrids in the future that hopefully can produce um, the same yields with less water. That would be great to have them on my fields this year. Uh, also, I, I hope in the future that we can get um, hybrids that will be able to utilize less nitrogen or less nutrients and grow the same amount of crop. And I know there's research that's being done on that. So my answer to that, if for the changing in in the weather pattern or the climate changes that I think technology will lead us out. Um, we do a great job of producing and we do a great job of overproducing every year no matter how bad the weather conditions are. I remember in 2008 we were talking about the excess moisture and I was trying to tell guys don't worry we're going to have we're going to have enough crop and I didn't believe it in my own field. I thought we really were done and we, we still overproduced what we thought we were gonna do. I feel this year, even with as bad as the drought is, that w with the new technology we have in below ground root systems that we are probably gonna do better than we think. So that's one thing about the, the US corn farmer, he always overproduces himself into an unprofitable position eventually. <laughs> and we will do it again and again and again. And that's a good thing for consumers to know that we can overproduce because the last thing we want is to be without product. Yeah, I just, I'd agree with a lot of what you just said to Tim, because, you know, like when I started farming, 140 bushel corn was, was what I grew. And this year I'm hoping I can get to 140 bushel corn with a short crop. So I, we've really come quite a ways in, in what we ex expect out of our um, production out there. Um, I guess the question is uh, how is it different than normal weather? Uh, living in northeastern Ohio, I, I would like someone to give me a definition of normal weather. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, like Brian said, that uh, you talk to the older guys and they've all faced their struggles, uh, 88, 56, 32, these are all years that you hear about from different generations and it, it's nothing new this drought it's just a different different one but it seems like the the variability has increased in intensity and how how fast it comes but as far as the past five to ten years uh, it's Ohio so it just keeps changing we've seen a lot of changes in the last five to ten years we we had our conservation practices all in place and then we had a five inch rain and a half an hour one night and watched a lot of it wash away and got to do it over again. Stuff, stuff that we thought that was bulletproof turned out not to be. But uh, we fixed it and we did some things some different and uh, learned a lot working with the Sugar Creek Watershed Project and the Soil and Water Conservation District. And there's a personal friend as an excavator to help me a lot. and So when these things happen and they do, you know, you just have to get back and fix it and start over and try it again. Were there any um, 
did you lack some technologies that you hoped would be there? Is there some, some new technologies that you maybe envisioned when dealing with some of these um, years when um, extreme dryness or extreme wetness was there? Um, you know, is there some things that research or um, technology development could help you? Well, it's pretty open-ended and wide, but if there's some ideas you could give us on that. Well, I'll start with, with that one. I guess that um, the idea of, of cover crops for me is like, well, the way that I'm going to make it work is that if, it, if it's able to add organic matter to my soil, that I'm able, you know, it's, I'm already kind of convinced that so, uh, no-till works for me. Um, I haven't used it continuously. I have hog manure in my rotation, and so I like to have that tilled in along with whatever other dry fertilizer that I need to incorporate that year for a five-year patch or a three-year patch. depends on which fields I'm rotating and stuff. But um, the idea of the, the cover crops and having something growing year-round is, is just like, boy, that's what I like to do is, is grow things. So now having cereal rye out there last winter that we'd aerial seeded into standing soybeans and corn in uh, early September before I got it done. That, uh, while it wasn't a perfect stand, it didn't grow everywhere. I had areas of fields where the, the dryness, um, you'd get a shower, it'd sprout, it'd start to get its root down, and then it'd die. And so, I, you know, if you had enough seed to soil contact, you know, that's what I recognize there. It's like, well, maybe it's worth waiting to, until, until after I harvest the soybeans and try and drill it in that way. So I'm going to be trying to compare those and, and doing more than one thing. Um, other things I've considered trying is even if I was brave enough to feel like the moisture was there, which I didn't want to try this year, but um, I have a cultivator that I haven't used for a few years, row crop cultivator that has a Hineker air seeder cart behind it. I used to plant soybeans that way. Uh, I'd plant them it blows the seed into the rooster tail of the cultivator. So if I could put on regular cultivation shovels instead of the wide ones and till a mix of radishes and, and clover and peas, I, there's so many things out there people are trying, you know, uh, try and get that seeded even late June when I could still get through the corn before it got too tall that uh, it'd already be seeded in there early, but it'd be low enough, it shouldn't compete with my corn crop. But this year it was like, I don't think anything's going to grow anyway. <laughs> you'd be throwing it into dry soil and no chance of rain, so I've seen. Um, How long have you done cover crops? I just started doing cover crops this last year, trying to try a few things, so. Maybe Anything just to just recording? expand on the cover crops, and it's, and it's fairly new in our area. Uh, working with a project <laughs> called High Yield Conservation and using radishes and oats. Um, actually, we're going to be planting them next week on, in seed corn, in standing seed corn, and in the end rows that are being destroyed, the male rows that are destroyed. And so that's a new technology that we're utilizing, and we're targeting uh, targeting those in just specific areas, areas where. We have compaction issues on the inroads where there's a lot of traffic with machines, uh, harvesting machines and detasselers and school buses with kids in them. So, so we're getting a comfort level with radishes. And the reason I'm doing them is because when it's 16 degrees, the radish notes are completely gone. And I know I'm starting next year into a clean field that I don't have to worry about burning down Roundup. Uh, and that, that's an issue for us because we have colder conditions and it's harder to get that burn down some years. Now this year it wasn't, it was, you put, it was just one of those years. But I don't want to go into those situations like that. But I want to have a cover crop and I want something that penetrates the ground, scavenges nitrogen and nutrients, and hopefully breaks up some compaction. So I'm the guinea pig in our area that's trying them. I tried them last year for the first time. I'm going to have more of them this year. And so us in the seed corn community in my area are looking at those and targeting in those specific areas. And, and that, I think with any of these projects, once the farmer has a comfort level of how they can manage it within their own system, with their own machinery, with their own techniques or their own skills, and it works, 
that's always a good thing. I, I think the only thing I've tried different or changes I've made in the last few years is the addition of the vertical tillage tool to try and keep a little more residue on top to, so that if we do get the heavy rains uh, in the winter that we'll be, uh, have a little bit more cover. I don't think we're lacking in technology. Usually I'm lacking in cash. There's, uh, <laughs> there's lots of neat stuff out there that you can get and try. And I started looking at vertical tillage tools, and my neighbor bought one, but he's a lot wealthier than me and is a lot bigger than what I could use. I farm a lot of contour strips, and so some of his equipment won't even fit in my fields. So we built one, and uh, we really like it. And uh, yeah, we, we try to use uh, as much new technology as we can. But sometimes you have to realize that things are a little bit out of your price range, so you have to make some um, adjustments. But I like to read, too. And uh, I like magazines, and I like just listening to these guys. Anytime there's a farm tour, if I can get away, I'm there to see what, uh, what you can learn, what you can use. That's a good segue into my next question. Uh, have you, who do you, I guess, normally seek information from, and has that changed at all? Have you felt like you had to go beyond your, your normal networks uh, to, to seek out some more information to deal with uh, weather variability? With weather? With weather, yeah, in, or in general. I just, I just invite Elwin Taylor to our meetings all the time. I like listening to him. He tells us what there's going to be a drought. I heard it three years ago he was going to have a drought, so I knew it was coming. So <laughs> <laughs> I... I, I rely on. He, no, he didn't, and that's what that's what scared me. That's why I knew it was coming. So I, I do. I mean, I think that that's good. We are in information overload as farmers. I mean, everybody's carrying uh, something around, and we're getting markets, we're getting weather, we're getting everything. So we, I think, we try to get as much information as we can, um, and it's probably information overload. Uh, commodity groups somewhat uh, extension but I think we we try to glean through as much as we can with all those sources and if we can find some accuracy in it I think it's great I guess uh, thinking about changes in weather and how to make those decisions I I don't think that I necessarily am looking for any particular place to tell me what's going to happen I just think that it's pretty well in the news. It, it, we live it out there. We kind of knew it was dry before they told us it was dry. <laughs> so, so uh, I, guess I, I liked your comment that you don't have all your eggs in one basket on farming, and, and I'm that way too. You know, I've got some ground that I'm doing tillage on more commonly, um, in, in planting several years of corn before I break it up with one year of beans, and other years, other soils that. I have to be very careful about tillage, and I just I've got a few spots where I haven't tilled anything for 10 years. Even on that corn on corn year, it's a, I just want to find some way to plant on the anhydrous track between the rows, do some something, try it. You know, you might be surprised how well it turns out. <laughs> and sometimes I have been. You know, it's like you grow 175 bushel on sandy sea slopes. Why I feel pretty good about that. So. Um, but, uh, yeah. I don't know that I've changed where I got information based on just the changing weather patterns. Um, uh, the conservation tillage conference at Ada in the winter, uh, that's been a really good place to pick up some information. I wish it was closer and there weren't blizzards in Ohio and <laughs> when, when it's going on. Um, uh, I'd like to see some sort of uh, field day here, the ARDC, uh, that would demonstrate some of these practices that you learn about there, uh, so we could see cover crop, crops in action that we've never seen before and things like that. It, that'd be a great help if some of you could pull that together. <laughs> yeah, proximity is a nice thing for a dairy farmer because we just have that couple hours between chores to get things get the things and sometimes it's hard to get away but uh, I like I watch my neighbors I don't know my wife 
the call always accuses me of not watching the road where I'm going. I'm always looking around, seeing what's working and what doesn't. And uh, I learn a lot from them. You know, what our soils are similar. Um, it's nice to see some of this stuff, these records that are set in Missouri and stuff, but um, we can't do that here. We don't have the same soil in the, the growing season, but I watch my neighbors and I kind of like it when those signs go up and I start writing down numbers. And, and then I, if I really want to know, I call them and ask them what it made. So we're all in the same kind of weather. So if it does good on their farm and we had bad weather, then I know it's pretty good stuff. And, and uh, these meetings like this, you can learn a lot from too. Thanks. Well, I th thank you so much for this information so far. And uh, I think it, we really kind of set the stage for um, getting a lot of good information. I'd like to open it up now to the rest of you. If you have questions for the panel, um, just stand up and, and speak loudly and I'll, I'll try to repeat your question. Yes. Um, I guess for me, what I did was uh, it was through a lot of reading in the farm periodicals and seeing that that was a possible uh, solution to keeping some more residue on top for me. Uh, I went to two different field days where uh, machinery dealers put on displays and had the machines in the field working uh, where I could see eight different machines and compare them all. Uh, one of them being the Farm Science Review. Uh, and that, by what I saw there, that's what led me to, to try it. Yeah, I have to give a positive comment to the ag um, industry that, that produces the magazines that we are flooded into our mailboxes all the time. I don't get them all read. That, I just run out, they stack up sometimes, you get busy. But um, still, it's like a lot, you could get a picture of what people are doing across the Midwest. And like, I know that from reading, you know, some of the things, there's farmers in Ohio that have been doing cover crops for a lot longer, and we're trying to adapt them up into northeast Iowa. You know, we, we maybe have a different growing season enough or some of the thing. We don't have a wheat isn't a common rotation up there. Um, so, so it's like trying to get something like a radish going early enough in the fall. I know it's a, bit, be a, a challenge to try and get something in there. But if I was, if I decided I like to grow cereal rye for myself to use on as a cover crop, then after I'd harvest that cereal rye, well, if I'd put it in certain places like along those end rows that get compacted and different places like that, you know, that'd be an opportunity. Um, but, but yeah, I just have to give a, a a bonus to and the other one of the other places I get a lot of information is every winter extension has a series of meetings I forget what they call them right now but you get to go listen to these great experts like several of them that are in the room and uh, hear what their research is is telling us about um, the nitrogen usage uh, tillage practices different things that people are are interested in cover crops, they'll have farmers that have had some experience uh, with cover crops, be at those and, and put on the seminars. And, and uh, so extension in, in is, a, is a great source too. Maybe just to talk a little bit more about the cover crops and the reason I did it, there was you know, a specific person who um, told me all the benefits that could be in a cover crop situation. And I, I guess I'm believing it right now and I'm in my second year and but the jury's still out so I'm all about productivity on my soils and making them all product pro productive and profitable and so he promised me that cover crops will do that for me to make make me more money and I also think it's a great thing uh, especially on seed corn production when that ground is sitting fallow for so long that and we want to grow things as farmers we, I mean we don't like seeing ground always bare and so if there is some benefit and there could be disease benefits, 
for the bean crop in the following year, if there's some weed suppression benefit, if there is uh, some nutrient um, storing capacity for the following crop, all those things resonate well in a production system. Okay. Another question? That one? No. <laughs> <laughs> one, of, one of the things, though, I maybe have some concern about is um, what, what's going to happen with the conservation program. I mean, they're balancing the back of this disaster on somewhat of the conservation program, so I'm a little concerned about that, concerned about where that program will go in the future. Uh, being part of the corn growers, we've been pushing for uh, eliminating direct payments. Um, we, that was a, the contribution that we thought we should do. We, we want a very strong uh, crop insurance program because I think that's one of the things that we can all agree on that's, especially in a year like this year, that a, that a strong insurance program is probably what we need. And conservation would come in second. I agree with Tim, uh, but a lot of times the debate over the farm program, it's hardly worth paying attention to till they get down to writing it and finishing it off. It's, it's going to be quite different. It doesn't affect my management at all. Anytime the government starts talking about cutting conservation, you're going to shoot yourself in the foot because all the work we've done to put in the waterways and the buffers and so forth, if you take that away and you're going to do count on the farmer doing it out of his own pocket, it's going to be a little tougher to do because farmers don't make a lot of money. We handle a lot of money. We handle a lot of big numbers. Um, recent, in recent years, my landlords have asked for more money, for more money for rent because in 2007, crop prices started going up. What they don't realize is our input costs go up also. Um, this last summer, we had a, a record wheat price, the highest price I've ever seen. It was almost a fairy tale. But I started looking for the price on seed wheat last week, and the seed companies didn't waste any time. They're right there to take it away from you. The problem is when the crop and commodity prices start going back down, the inputs don't relax. So we are the ones that, that forefront that cost. So I think that if they take conservation out, that's, that's a bad thing. Sure. Um, uh, Rattan would like some information on what, how they feel about carbon credits and what would be a fair price if, and the, if they have interest in trading uh, for carbon credits. Probably I'm limited on knowledge about the carbon trading program. I know there's one in Iowa. There's a couple of groups that have them. Uh, the answer would be if um, there's something that I'm do doing in my system right now that I can actually collect some kind of credit for, I would be in favor of if it had uh, more buy-in or there's across a larger group a sampling. So, um, but I really, I, I, I was not part of any group before, so I know a little about it. Uh, through the Sugar Creek Watershed Group, they did the uh, uh, trading of water quality and uh, that worked out really well. If it was done to a small enough level like that, I think it would work out real well. I don't know if it would be, I think it would be a challenge to, to do it on a large scale. If it, if it took like me signing into a contract of saying, oh, this is how I'm going to farm for five years, I probably wouldn't be interested. <laughs> I just don't, I just don't like the idea of limiting my choices that I'm going to have down the road by tying myself into something like a kind of, that's what's kept me out of the CSP program. Um, so I'm not sure. <laughs> Any other last questions? Sure.
the the rootworm problem was happening around right around in our area. I did not experience it last year. Um, two thirds of my uh, of my corn acres are in seed corn, so they're sprayed and there's there's nothing alive in that field after they get done. So there's uh, there probably is not the rootworm pressure, but to answer the second part, almost everyone um, was putting on some type of insecticide along with the trait this year, and but I wasn't one of I I didn't I did not and and um, my traded corn we've dug corn on corn and it looks great. There's very little feeding. It's working. The technology is working, but I know there was you know a breakdown in the technology in certain areas last year in our area. I don't, I don't think a lot of farmers were biologists before they were farmers. <laughs> I guess is a, is a way to say it. Is they think more mechanically in terms of, well, this product will work, it'll work. I should use it on everything. Um, the reserves, the, 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 set, the idea of how, why those would work, I don't think that was effectively communicated or watched over by the seed company's salespeople necessarily. I don't know how that all worked, played out. Uh, the the uh, idea was to be able to always make sure you had a population that was not affected by the BT that would be out there and and producing plenty of offspring so that you they would compete against any that had developed any resistance and I, I really think there was a breakdown in that understanding that probably led to those problems that's my impression of of what happened there I know there was a uh, few years back where we had a BT product that was effective against an earworm, but not against the Western bean cutworm. And so we basically opened the door to Western bean cutworm. And so then we had to come in and we either used a different BT event or, you know, so there's a lot of these things where, you know, nature abhors a vacuum. <laughs> it's, you know, you, you create an opportunity out there then it's going to happen, uh, the resistance issues and stuff. So. Maybe just add on, too, I want to believe in the technology that we're, that we're paying for in that bag. And the last thing I want to do is go back to what I did as a kid, handling bags of skull and crossbone type material. And I, I don't think that's where we're going to go long term. Hopefully the technology improves to a point and we can be selective where we do use those products, uh, those insecticides. I, that's. I don't think anybody's goal here is to spend more money for those kind of products when the technology should be working. Okay, well, I don't see any more questions, but I, I want to reiterate again, we really appreciate the time that you've taken to travel here and to provide us with some insight on, on how you're thinking about weather and, and climate issues. And uh, I'd like to give you guys a round of applause for being with us today.